two. Grants for all. Okay, and then we have uh, 0 0.462. Are there any units in this 0.462? The answer is no, they're not. Because this is a ratio of velocities, and the velocity units cancel right there. Okay. So, um, so we have, uh, let's see, 131 gram per mole. That comes from that. Is there a likely gas that that might be? Yeah, maybe xenon, right? The xenon is 131.294. So it might be you know, a specific isotope of xenon. In fact, it would be, what isotope of xenon would that be? Xenon has uh, 54 protons. So if the exact mass is 131, how many neutrons are in it? I don't know, 131 minus 54 would be... Like 75 neutrons in, in that xenon atom. I didn't think about this till now, but that'd make for an interesting problem on a test. Combining rate of effusion, which won't be on this test, so don't worry, but you could combine rate of effusion and then say, what gas is it, and write a nuclear symbol from that. Like combining concepts. Jasmine's like, no, I ain't feeling it. No, no, no. no please don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, I do like combining concepts, okay? Because if you can combine concepts from different parts of the class, then, you've, then you're really garnering an overall big picture of, of chemistry. Okay. So I'll probably forget about this, though, when it comes time for you to write the next exam. So you're probably okay. <laughs> but that's just like, thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so again, the tricky one with this one was rate rate of gas A um, being the unknown gas, and just knowing that you use that from the language. Uh, here's a an easier one, I think. Actually, uh, calculate the ratio of rate of effusion for oxygen divided by hydrogen. This one's really easy. All right, so, if you wanted to calculate. So it says uh, <clears throat> oxygen over hydrogen. So now they're saying, okay, calculate the rate of O2 divided by the rate of H2 gas. And again, it's equal to the square root of, what is my setup? Molar mass of hydrogen, right? You gotta, you gotta, it's like the, the diagonal from this. <coughs> So it's just asking you to calculate what is the ratio of the rate. So it's saying, what is this ratio? And at this point, we can just plug in the numbers for molar mass. So we have, what's the molar mass of H2? It's going to be 2 times 1.01 gram per mole, right? Uh, oxygen will be 32. All right, punch it in and you get a, uh, an answer. Uh, should get uh, <clears throat> 0.251. So what does this tell you about the, the rate of effusion? Wh which gas effuses faster into a vacuum, oxygen or hydrogen? Based on this number. <clears throat> So if, if this rate, if this ratio, let me write here. Okay, so that, that ratio is only 0.251. Does that mean that the rate of H2, am, am I dividing by a larger number or a smaller number than, than the top? Larger. Yeah, larger number, right? Just mathematically, rate of H2 has to be bigger than rate of oxygen for this to be, to be so small. Okay, so what this means is that um, 
Which gas effuses faster? Yeah, yeah hydrogen effuses faster. All right, it's a lighter gas, so it'll. It, another way of saying it is, it has a better conductivity. It'll flow through the. It'll flow through the pinhole faster because it, it it's smaller, it's lighter, it'll travel more quickly. All my other questions. Oh, I was just gonna say, could you look at the molar gas just because it is a lighter? Right. Exactly. So yeah, I mean. To answer the question, you didn't really need to do the problem. I could have told you hydrogen would diffuse faster just because it has a lighter molar mass. Yeah, but the, this equation shows that. Okay. And I would actually see this in my research uh, when I'm when I'm when I was retracting the stem in my in my setup. Um, I would I would see the pressure dropping faster with uh, lighter gases in the chamber. You can actually see it. <clears throat> so let me, let, me, um, let me show you, uh, just real quick, just want to throw this in here for context because I, I think it's super cool. Uh, you don't need to know this from the test, but just to, just to open your eyes to some research. Uh, so we had a, a chamber, we were doing this uh, atmospheric chemistry studies in. We were catalyzing reactions with laser beams as a uh, pseudo sunlight source. Right, just kind of some fun stuff. Um, so we would shoot the laser beam right in this region right here, um, and so for so this is the glass wall of the chamber, and it kind of would come out this way and it would come out this way. Um, and at the ends of this glass chamber were these uh, UV um, UV passable uh, pyrex uh, <coughs> plates. So laser beams could just right go right through it and, and start initiating chemistry inside. So we would send, you know, blue light, maybe closer to the UV, which is typical sunlight, um, into this chamber. Um, we'd initiate some chemistry, and then at the same time, we'd pull, we'd, we would, uh, an electronic pulse from a computer would pull this stem back, and the gases would effuse through this little orifice right here, as this as the stem got pulled back. And so, um, but it was pulsed. So, um, so the computer program would send an electronic pulse and it would pull this stem back but only for a moment and then this, the, it was spring loaded so it, it would spring back closed again so it, it would retract, retract, retract and so that's why you get little, little pockets of gases being pulsed into the, into the uh, vacuum chamber. So this is where, how we were using the, uh, effusion in our research. Um, now inside the mass spectrometer on this side where there's a vacuum, you're looking at pressures about 10 to the minus 9 torr. Alright, in atmospheric conditions we're at 760 torr, right? So think about that, that's like outer space, like there's nothing inside, you know, this, uh, this chamber here. Um, once you get inside this chamber though, the molecules get really, really cold and you can um, use another laser to ionize those molecules and get nice structure in terms of uh, what wavelengths are being absorbed at and such. Um, let me show you an example of a molecule we blew, blew, we blew to smithereens. Okay, uh, so um, here's a, a molecule called benzene. It's a known carcinogen, it's a common pollutant. Um, so here's benzene, it's just a six-membered ring, alternating double bonds. It's got resonance, if you might remember what resonance is, you know. Um, and so uh, we focused this laser beam inside the vacuum. There was another window uh, connected to the inside of the vacuum chamber, okay, and we pulsed a laser in there, and we just blew up this molecule, um, or, or actually many of the molecules, to get a signal. <clears throat> and what you're looking at here is the intensity of the ion fragments as a function of the time of flight that it takes these molecules to travel down the tube to the detector. And this is a real-life application of kinetic molecular theory. Lighter molecules travel faster. Heavier molecules travel more slowly. Okay, and so you can see the um, ion fragments that came from this. Uh, what do you notice about the ion fragments here versus here versus here? What do you notice about that? Do the, do the fragments get heavier or do they get lighter? They get heavier. Right, they get heavier. What do you notice about the flight time it takes for these molecules to fly down the tube? It takes longer, right? So the heavier molecules take longer to travel down the tube to the detector because they're heavier. They travel more slowly. The lighter fragments, they've got a higher velocity, so they take less time to get down to the detector. And so they have a technique called time-of-flight mass spectrometry 
which will um, analyze molecules according to their ion pattern and their, their flight time of the ions that come from that. So basically, I send a laser beam, you, you blow up these molecules. When I say blow them up, I mean, you know, we're taking a C686 and blowing it up into different size fragments. They're all cations because uh, when, when I say blow up, you, you, the laser beam is actually popping off electrons and causing the molecule to fragment as a result of that. Okay, so, um, so you, know, you can analyze molecules this way and get a fingerprint for molecules. And that's how mass spectrometry works. Mass spec is used in uh, forensics, it's used in uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, it's used in a whole slew of different kinds of labs. Um, and essentially, they, over the years, they've built libraries of spectra like this to identify molecules. And so, like, you know, if you had this spectrum, they would match it to a library and tell you it's benzene. Okay. Now, I knew this was benzene because I knew I put benzene in the reaction chamber. But, but in real life, the way it works is, is you don't know what that is yet. You match your spectrum to a library, and it tells you what it is. Isn't that kind of cool? So they... <coughs> So they they uh, they analyze uh, for you know um, you know drugs or for uh, you know, other crime scene type of, of evidence. For example, they say, oh, this killer used uh, cesium bromide to kill his victim. Like, how do they know he used cesium bromide? Well, you know, stick it in the mass spectrometer. It tells you what it is, right? You know, or something like that. <clears throat> okay. Or phenobarbital. There you go. Like, oh, this person overdosed on phenobarbital. Well, how do they know they overdosed on phenobarbital? Well, they stuck it in a mass spectrometer and matched the library for phenobarbital. You know? um, so anyway, just introduced me to the, the real world of chemistry, uh, kinetic molecular theory being applied to the real world. Cool stuff, huh? All right. Enough of that. Amazingly, interestingly, possibly, hopefully not too boring stuff. Okay, so let's get real and talk about real gases. Um, so real gases obey um, the ideal gas law at low pressures and high temperatures. Okay, so what happens, and the key word there is obey. That's it, all you should know, just obey. All right, especially once you get married. Okay, you can do it. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, it's good for you, especially the guy. Okay. Um, so real gases obey the ideal gas law at low pressures and high temperatures. And the reason why is because um, at low pressures, think about it, at low pressures, there's very few gas particles in the mixture. Right? It's low pressure. So because of that, when the gas particles do collide, um, there's not a whole lot left for it to stick to. So what are the two main postulates of kinetic molecular theory? You're assuming that, that gas particles don't attract when they collide, and you're assuming that the gas particles themselves don't take much volume. So if, there, if there's really low pressure, the gas particles don't take much volume, right? Because there's not much gas in there. Um, and then, of course, uh, at high temperatures, the collisions are so fast that, uh, that when they collide, they bounce off each other rather than stick. All right, so you're, you're kind of overcoming the attractive forces at high temp. Okay, um, on the other hand, real gases disobey the ideal gas law at high pressures and low temps. So at high pressure, there's so many gas particles in the mixture now that they take up a uh, significant volume. Okay, and then the other thing too is that at low temperatures, it's like uh, if you had a collision, they're moving more slowly now, and they've got time to stick together for time. Okay, and if you cool the temperature down low enough, you'll actually get condensation, and the pressure will start to drop even further than what it should. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on at high pressures and low temps. Um, we have a, a, a graphical representation of this. Um, so here's gas, real gas behavior at high pressure. So you have uh, <coughs> molar volume and then versus the pressure. As the pressure increases, okay, an ideal gas will, uh, um, oh yeah, this is, uh, let's see. Yeah, so high pressure volume is higher than predicted, okay. Um, 
So in other words, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, if you look at just the, the volume that argon uh, gas takes up at a, at a given pressure, so it makes sense that, um, that uh, the volume, the molar volume drops at higher pressure, but it's higher than we'd expect at high, at high pressure. Okay, so it's basically as you get more gas molecules, you get more volume, right, than what should it be expected. Okay, for um, this one's a little easier to look at. Um, at low temp, the pressure is lower than expected. So here's temperature and then pressure versus temp. So as the temperature drops, the, the actual xenon gas in real real world is lower than we'd expect for an ideal gas. <clears throat> it's not a lot, but it's, it's enough to make a difference. So xenon gas condenses more than an ideal gas would at low, at low temps. Okay. Let's look at the equation that describes this. So for um, real gases, we have a modified ideal gas equation. We call it the Van der Waals equation. How many of you have ever heard of Van der Waals forces? Just curious, from like Chem 7, maybe your professor mentioned Van der Waals forces. So it comes from this guy, you know, uh, who, who um, developed this uh, equation for real gases. Um, so yeah, the, the ideal gas law we know is PV equals NRT, right? We're all okay with that. To take into account the two estimates for kinetic molecular theory, we have to take into account the intermolecular forces between, between gas molecules and also the um, volume that gas molecules might actually consume. So this term right here, this n squared a over v squared, takes into account the attractive forces between gas molecules. And this nb term takes into account the, the volume of space that the molecules actually occupy. The right side of the equal side is the same. Okay, what are these, uh, N, what does N mean, what does B mean, what does A mean, what is, what is that? Well, N still means moles, okay, because that's always the same. Okay, and V still means volume, okay, in liters. So really, it's just A and B. And these are correction factors that um, have been developed to take into account um, the deviation from ideal behavior. So A and B are experimentally determined constants for each individual gas. So a value for A, and B will be different depending on the gas. So helium has its A factor and its B factor. You know, uh, xenon has its A and B factors. Uh, the units for them are, are up there to make the units work out. Okay, um, what do you notice about the correction factors as you get further down this table in general? <coughs>
So solving the van der Waals equation, let me put it back on the last slide. How would we solve the van der Waals equation for p real? How would we do that? Let's do some algebra. More algebra. Ugh. Okay, so um, so if we do some algebra here, so we got p real, and it's uh, uh, n squared times a divided by b squared. Okay, and it's times b minus n b equals n r t. So let's let's solve this for p real. Right, divide by <coughs> divide by v minus n b. So you end up getting p real plus n squared times a over v squared, and that's now going to be equal to n r t over v minus n b. Okay, and then from there, subtract, subtract this to the other side, and we're there. So it looks really nasty, but it's actually pretty easy. It's not too bad. OK, so p real is now equal to n rt over v minus nb uh, minus n squared a divided by v squared. So rearranging, we get this, this kind of equation here. And now this is just a matter of plugging and chugging. And we could do uh, P ideal while we're at it here. So P ideal is equal to simply NRT over B, right? That's pretty straightforward. Okay, so just doing P real now, we have um, how many moles of gas? We have one mole, 1 1.00 mole, times the gas constant. We're going back to this 8.026 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Temperature was 95 Kelvin. And the volume was, what, 2 liters? 2.00 liters minus. And then for carbon dioxide, the, um, the <coughs> B factor, or we have one mole. Right, the B factor was uh, 0 0.0427. And the units are liters per mole. Okay, so it's all of that minus uh, n squared, which is 1.00 moles squared, times the A factor for CO2, which is uh, 3.59 liters squared.
and the seven would be the last significant figure because these are all sig, uh, three sig figs here. And then from this portion over here, let's look at the units. Uh, moles cancel. Uh, the liters minus the liters ends up being liter units in the denominator, which cancel out, cancels out that liters there. Okay, and then these Kelvin, they also cancel. These moles also cancel. So what units are we left with from this? Atmospheres. So we're going to be adding atmospheres minus atmospheres, and as we should, we should get an atmospheres for P real. We, we should get a pressure unit. So um, you know how in the practice exam I, I give you like a, a calculation, just punch in your calculator, you tell me what the units are? This would be something that like would be, you know, could you figure out what the units are for this? Just by looking at them. All right, so just to run through, I think the thing that's hard to see is the liters and the liters here together cancel out this one on top. All right, that's probably the hardest one to see. All right, moles cancel, that's easy. Kelvin cancel, that's easy. These moles here cancel, that's easy, right? So, because you're taking liters minus another liters in the denominator, that's going to be liters in the denominator, right? And that's going to cancel out the liters in the numerator. Do you, do you see it? <coughs> yeah, well, think about it. If we took this value minus this thing, you get liters for the unit, right? And then that cancels out what's up here. So that's what's going on. So the only hard thing with the Van der Waals equation is just the units, like just keeping track of them. But just know that for each part of it, you know, for this chunk and for that chunk, it'll still come out to atmospheres for the units. <clears throat> so what comes out from this, okay, is, uh, let's see, we end up getting uh, 3.98, 3.98, ATM. And this is just one uh, decimal place for the sig fig, or two, two sig figs, because 95 Kelvin only has two sig figs in it. Okay. So for P real, we get 3.9829 minus 0.8975, and we get a total pressure here of 3.0. 854 ATM. Now we're doing subtraction, so one decimal place. I'm going to underline the zero as being my last sig fig now. If we do P real, or excuse me, P ideal, make another color mark. So plugging in for PP uh, ideal, we get uh, 1.00 moles, 0 0.08206, okay, times 95 Kelvin. Thank you. 